thank you very much. I return you to the English-speaking version of your channel here. Um, there'll be a time when I can do this in Greek, but I don't think it's today. <laughs> um, my name is Peter Spiegel. I'm the US Managing Editor of the Financial Times. It's my great pleasure to share the stage with Prime Minister Kyriakos Mitsotakis. Uh, we just realized we did this four years ago, so maybe every four years I come back and do it again. Well, you were certainly lucky last time. <laughs> I hope you'll bring us luck again. Um, we're here at the Delphi Economic Forum. Why don't we start with economics? It's obviously, I work for the Financial Times. It's my, it's my area of great interest. Um, and the most interesting, I think, and most significant economic event in recent days has been S&P's decision to upgrade uh, Greece's, Greece's debt. And if you read the S&P report, they cite a lot of things we cite in the Financial Times, these big numbers we, we talk about all the time, uh, two years of, of above-trend growth, um, reduction of the debt-to-GP ratio, primary surplus. So that's the, 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 sort of the top-line news. I'm just wondering, there is also, if you take a step back, there is still the truth that debt, the, the GDP per capita is still much lower than it was pre-crisis. Pre these inflation um, pressures right now, so your average Greek citizen may not be feeling the effects of those top line numbers that I like to talk about and the, and the international creditors like to talk about. Are you concerned that that average Greek working class guy is not necessarily feeling the benefits from those top line numbers? Well, first of all, let me point out uh, that uh, the progress that the Greek economy has made over the past uh, years, I think, has been um, uh, significant, as you pointed out. We're growing at a much, much faster pace than uh, the EU average. Uh, we brought down our debt uh, to GDP ratio significantly. We've been able to create almost 300,000 jobs. We brought in significant amount of foreign direct uh, investment. Uh, and it was exactly this uh, growth that allowed us to support uh, Greek society during the pandemic, but also during the recent uh, energy crisis. So were it not for above average growth, we would not have the fiscal space to be able to deliver this type of support. Are we concerned about the fact that uh, GDP per capita is still low? Yes, for the simple reason that we have not yet made up all the lost ground from 10 years uh, of, uh, of a profound crisis. And this exactly is our agenda for the second term. Uh, how are we going to truly converge with Europe? And there's only one way to truly converge, and that is to grow at a significantly faster pace than the Eurozone average. How do you do that? You don't do it through consumption uh, fueled by debt. You have to do it through uh, investment, through innovation, through quality job creation. And my number one metric when I look at the performance for the next four years would be the increase in the average salary uh, uh, of the average Greek employee. My commitment is that I can deliver 25% growth uh, in salaries. Uh, and of course, 25%, close to 25% growth also for the minimum wage. Uh, I think this is perfectly doable as the labor market is also tightening. Um, companies are doing well, so I think they will be sort of forced to also pay better salaries. And this is something that uh, the average Greek will feel in terms of the disposable income. Last point, when you look at disposable income, you also have to look at taxes. Uh, we were extremely consistent uh, in our commitment to reduce the taxes for the middle class. We've done so across the board. There's still room to further reduce taxes, but of course we're moving towards a period where fiscal discipline is again going to be the rule rather than the exception. And we have to be extremely careful that we don't derail all the good progress that we have made over the past years. Let me push you a bit on this because I, I have some questions later that I want to talk about in terms of the elections coming up. But when I was in Brussels, there were several Eurozone prime ministers who came in, did the hard work of, of, of repairing the economy, of doing a lot of the same things you did for the last four years. I'm thinking Enda Kenny, I'm thinking in Ireland, I'm thinking Mario Monti in Italy, I'm thinking of Pedro Passos Coelho in Portugal. And after four years, their voters said, thank you very much, mm -hmm. and, and, and kicked them out. Just again, to push you a little bit on this, sometimes it feels to me that your average voter doesn't care about the things the Financial Times writes, it doesn't care about the thing that the S&P says. Is that, are you concerned at all that, that those voters will thank you very much for the work you've done and, and move on from the crisis and, 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 do, and, and look for, for another, another path? Well, first of all, elections, Peter, are always about choices. And in this case, the choice uh, between the two parties competing to run the country is, in my mind, extremely stark. Uh, are we going to continue down a path where we have actually delivered um, sustainable growth? Uh, average incomes have improved in spite of the fact that there has been an erosion uh, through inflation. We delivered on, on job growth. And, and all in all, the economy is clearly doing um, uh, much better. Uh, not everyone is benefiting to the extent that we could because of inflation, but we all understand that inflation is not a Greek phenomenon. 
And even when you look at the inflation numbers, we're doing better than uh, the um, European average. Uh, what is the choice um, offered by our main uh, sort of political competitor? Uh, a return to the days uh, of uh, promises without uh, any substance. I was looking today at the new program announced by Syriza. The previous one, and I'm saying the previous one because they already announced sort of a program a month ago, we estimated it would cost us 45 billion euros, 45 billion euros over four years. A new one, you'd add another 20 to 30 billion on top of that. I mean, we all understand that this is, uh, this is nonsense. I mean, this is never going to be implemented. And if it were to be implemented, it would directly lead to, towards a new uh, bankruptcy. So I don't think there's another party that has a clear plan on how to actually grow the economy, but also on how to achieve um, uh, real convergence. Are the voters appreciative of what we have done? Of course, voters are feeling the pain of inflation, but they also know that we supported them um, with their energy prices. They see it every month in their energy bills, what is the subsidy provided by the state, and they know that we've done our best in terms of supporting them with the prices at the, at the supermarket. We, re we sort of refused um, to horizontally cut um, VAT taxes because we think that this is something that doesn't work and eventually doesn't benefit everyone. But we use the fiscal space um, uh, to offer uh, targeted support to those who were in, uh, in greater need. So I think overall, we've done, I think, the best job possible given uh, the context. And frankly, the sense that I get from my campaigns, I'm not going to refer to the polls. The polls indicate that we have a, a healthy lead over Syriza. The sense I get from the country is that the mood of the country is, you know, keep on doing what you're doing, move at a faster pace. We want more reforms, not less reforms, uh, and make sure, you know, you learn from your mistakes uh, and uh, keep on uh, pushing down the path that we have already charted. Let me stick with the economy before I get back to politics. One of the things you said at, at the outset was that you cited as, as, as positive is, is the, the record foreign investment that we see. And obviously, we, we pay a lot of attention to that it, it, as a sort of a measure of how foreign investor confidence is in, in, a, in an economy. There have been record increases, but if you look at where Greece is on sort of the European league table, it's still pretty low. It's down sort of Bulgaria level. Why do you think that is? Why do you think foreign investors are still relatively reluctant compared to some of your, your peer competitors to, to invest in Greece? Well, I think, first of all, uh, I think the progress that we have made has been uh, significant. Uh, we go from record to record. And if you look at the quality of the companies that are actually uh, investing, we've been able to put Greece uh, on the international investor map. And I'm not just referring um, to sectors where we have a natural comparative advantage, such as tourism. I mean, tourism is not insignificant. We have uh, significant investments going into high quality tourism, and of course, we, we, need, we need that. But if you look at the tech companies that have invested uh, in Greece, the pharma companies that have invested in Greece, what do they see in Greece? I think they see a country uh, that is part of the Eurozone, um, that is still um, relatively cheap compared to our competitors, so we start from a low base, but that has a highly, highly talented labor force, both in Greece but also outside Greece, people who are actually uh, returning um, uh, to, to Greece. So this is not just a country that focuses on one or two sectors. I was uh, yesterday in, in, in Thrace and I visited, I don't know many, not many people know about this, but a cutting edge battery factory with a thousand employees that is actually able to bring people back uh, from abroad. So these are the types of investments that we actually need. Uh, we will be able to attract more investments. And of course, uh, the story needs to get out. I remember when I first spoke to Microsoft, it was in Davos uh, in January 2020. At the time, we were pitching a story that many people liked, but they weren't quite sure that we could uh, actually deliver. Now they see that we can deliver, and I'm sure more investors will, will come to Greece, also taking advantage of the broader trends, uh, you know, uh, nearshoring, you know, bringing your supply chains closer to the European market. Uh, we have an important role to play uh, in all these um, uh, global developments. Let me ask about investment from one country in particular, China. Um, obviously, China has made significant investments in Piraeus. Um, they've done in other strategic uh, ports in Europe. They, I think, welcome the opportunity to provide 5G technologies here in Greece. You have basically said no, if, if I'm not mistaken, uh, expansion of Piraeus and, and, and other Chinese investments. What would be your message to a Chinese company that wanted to come well, invest in Greece? Let me first of all say that uh, we respect um, uh, the contract signed by previous governments. The port of Piraeus was uh, privatized at a time when uh, essentially no one was interested in investing uh, in Greece. And I have to be honest, uh, overall this privatization has been a success. 
but it is the only major Chinese investment in Greek infrastructure. And uh, the Chinese have not been particularly present over the past three and a half years, and the significant infrastructure projects um, have taken uh, uh, place. So what we want is to significantly diversify uh, our investment base. And of course, there are sectors where we are fully aligned uh, with uh, European strategic imperatives, uh, where we've taken uh, decisions that uh, certain countries are simply not welcomed, 5G being uh, one of them. Okay. Would you share some of the American concerns? I mean, it's, it's, there's some countries in Europe that do share these concerns. Would you put yourself in the camp that, that shares Look, the American uh, you concerns? Know, I always about... get the question about PROs, but you know, the Chinese are not going to take the port and leave at some point. I mean, we're still regulating the, uh, uh, the port, so I don't see any particular strategic threat. When it comes to technology, I fully share uh, the very, very valid uh, concerns that uh, we need to be uh, vigilant and, uh, and not naive about what is really okay. happening in, okay. in the tech space. And if there is, as it seems to be happening, a real sort of decoupling between two competing technological systems, we know on which side of the fence we'll be sitting. One last question on the economy. I spent some time in the last week meeting with, with Greek businessmen um, who, who are mostly uh, fully embracing of, of, of the numbers we talked about. The one thing I get pushed back on is still their interaction with the Greek state um, tends to be uh, frustrating, I think is the word they put it. Um, you, we first met when you were a minister in the Samaras government, you were working on, on civil service reform. I know it's been something you've been working on. Um, is that something that has still needs work? I mean, how are you disappointed, I guess, all on the progress we've been able to make on civil service reform, on the judiciary, on some of those things where businesses yeah. interact with the state? This is a big um, and important agenda for us. Civil service reform is an ongoing project. I do need to point out that for the average citizen and the small business, the interaction with the state has been significantly simplified. I think our gov.gr um, platform, which has been modeled after the gov.uk platform, has been a, a resounding success, uh, something that you know, even people that don't vote for us uh, actually recognize. There's much more we can do in terms of digitizing processes. But at the same time, uh, uh, the public administration still has pockets of resistance. I've made two very clear commitments for my, um, uh, three commitments for my second term. First of all, we can be totally digital by 2027 in terms of all the processes um, and all the interactions between uh, citizens and state. The second is performance assessment for all civil servants uh, with clear sort of reward for those who actually perform best. We've tried this uh, already in pockets of the civil service and it has actually worked um, extremely, uh, extremely well, you know, delivering results. Um, um, uh, above um, uh, expectation, and of course, when it comes to justice, we need to bring, um, uh, you know, the, the timeline regarding uh, justice um, uh, close to the European average. We've made some progress, but this is a very important topic for me, um, uh, and uh, we need to clearly push harder when it comes to also digitizing uh, justice. We've done a lot of work in terms of the legal infrastructure, uh, I think overall, if you ask companies, the interaction with the state is much simpler in terms of accessing European funds. Uh, the RRF um, has been a great success. I think we've probably done better than any other European country in terms of leveraging both the grant and the debt component of the RRF. Uh, it was very, very, very easy bureaucratically for companies to actually get access to those uh, uh, funds. So overall, I'd say, you know, work in progress. Let me also highlight the fact that in terms of European funds, we were um, sort of laggards and now we are champions in terms of how quickly we can absorb you know, the structural funds. And of course, these frequently benefit uh, businesses. So I think we've made measurable progress, but of course, you know, much more to be done, especially on, uh, on justice and on the HR component of the civil service. Okay. Let me go to politics, because I think that's much what our crowd is, is waiting for. Um, the, you got elected uh, with rather handily uh, four years ago with about a close to 40 percent. Um, I think at the at the peak of the pandemic, which you got a lot of credit for handling better than than most of your your European colleagues, you were topping 50 percent. Obviously, in the last couple of months, we've seen a pretty sharp drop, and um, I think it's in my discussions here that it is very much tied to this horrific, horrific, horrific uh, tragedy uh, with the, the train accident in northern Greece. Now. I don't want to bring make it a, a, a human tragedy into a political issue, but I guess the voters decide what, 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 is, a, what is a political issue. How concerned are you that you, you had a well-earned reputation for competence and efficiency, that this, this, this train accident in some ways undermines that with the, in the voters' minds? Um, this was uh, a shocking accident. 
uh, and I think it, it all sort of, it, it shook us to the core. Uh, and I think people were right, you know, at the beginning to be emotional and to be frustrated. They expected better from the state, they expected better from us, and they were right to actually hold us accountable for an accident that should not have happened. I'm not gonna go into the history, whether this uh, sort of um, uh, surveillance system regarding the track should have been delivered. You know, it happened on our watch. I assumed the responsibility, and I said, I gotta fix it now. Uh, it's a pity that, you know, it will be fixed by September. Uh, it's a tragedy that it will be fixed by September, and it wasn't ready uh, before that. But uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, tragedies happen, mistakes happen. The question is, how do you bounce back, and how do you learn from those um, uh, mistakes? Uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, an election is about uh, a four-year term record uh, and about what you tell people you want to do the next four years. Uh, we focus on our record because, uh, in our case, it indicates a government that was able to stick to its commitments, something which is highly unusual uh, in Greek politics, in spite of the fact that we had to deal with at least four major crises, because adding to uh, Ukraine and the pandemic, you know, the migration crisis, and the turbulence with Turkey. So we were in constant crisis management mode. At the same time, we were able to deliver on our promises. So when I present my plan, my vision, for the next four years, I think Greeks will probably tend to believe me more than my main competitor because I have delivered what I told them uh, four years ago. So I'm uh, sort of on the campaign trail um, every day now, uh, interacting with, uh, uh, with people, and I get the, the sense I, uh, I get, even the polls are again looking better than they did uh, a, a month ago, but the overall sense uh, I get is what I told you uh, before. People want the stability, they understand that we need a stable uh, government because we are uh, in a um, uh, sort of in a difficult uh, in a complicated part of the, uh, of the world and I think stability is um, uh, quite important and I think they buy into our agenda. And again, what I always find interesting is that the pockets of resistance to change are, are relatively well-defined, but if you ask more people uh, the simple question, more or less reform, they'll tell you more reform rather than less, which is a big change. Why is this happening in Greece and it's not happening in other countries such as France? Because we went through uh, you know, our difficult years, we went through the fantasies of uh, an alternative which was never really there, which brought the country to the brink of a disaster, and I think also the comparison is you know, between a party that essentially says hasn't learned anything. They have not forgotten anything. They have not learned anything. They still keep um, you know, playing, the same, playing exactly to the same um, uh, tune, uh, not really understanding that the world has, uh, uh, has changed, uh, and not being able to deliver, in my mind, an alternative, a credible alternative vision for where they want to take the country. One last one on this. I mean, you have said here, and I know you've said this before, it's happened on my watch, there's been years, perhaps, of, 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 of problems in the rail system. Happened on my watch, I'm going to take responsibility. Is that, do you think, a way to try to win over some of these voters that may have, have lost some, some confidence in your, in your, in your efficiency okay. here? We cannot turn the clock back, uh, and there's nothing else uh, you can do but to make sure that you, uh, that you actually uh, fix a problem. But again, uh, in, in my mind, uh, an election is about the big choice. So the big choice is the direction of the country and the nature of the government, because there's been a lot of discussion, I'm sure you followed, about whether we'll have a coalition government, um, uh, you know, how complicated things are uh, with, with proportional uh, uh, representation. We have in our audience our good friend, uh, the, the, my good friend, personal friend, the president of Bulgaria, uh, and, uh, and he knows how complicated it has been uh, in Bulgaria to actually form a, a, a government, and what an important role he has played to stabilize uh, the country, but I'm sure he would also like for an elected government to be, uh, to be formed, and, uh, and it hasn't happened yet in, uh, in Bulgaria. So what, in, in my mind, we know we'll have a second election with um, the electoral law that we've always tended to have um, over, over the past uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, decades, but the first election is gonna be the critical one, because the first election is gonna send a signal which party is going to win, and at the end of the day, who the Greeks would like as their prime minister, because in a, in a parliamentary system, yes, you're voting for a party, but you're also voting um, for a prime ministerial candidate. And that is why you know, the position of some parties, in particular PASOK, is so inexplicably weird. I mean, what does PASOK tell us right now? Um, we don't want you know, either Mitsotakis or Tsipras to be prime ministers. We want somebody else, but we won't tell you who. I mean, this doesn't really make any, uh, any sense um, uh, to me. Uh, and uh, eventually I don't think that this approach is going to be rewarded by the Greek people.
All right, I have a coalition question later. Let me just ask you one more one that's that's a little bit tougher, which is the other hit you've had. Um, it's made a, a, a lot of a lot of news internationally, including in the FT. Was this incident where um, the the National Intelligence Agency was was alleged to have been spying on the political opposition? I know you have said that this is not something that you knew about, but talk to me a little bit about lessons learned there. What, what did you learn as a prime minister that when you we learned about this? Well, uh, you know, we made our position very very clear, uh, and again, there were behaviors which were inexcusable, and that's why we had to take action, and, um, uh, and that's why we actually revamped uh, our uh, intelligence agency completely. Uh, and we're actually the only country that has officially and legally banned the sale of illegal spyware. Uh, not other countries have done so. So we actually um, uh, sort of took uh, the lessons to, to heart, and now we have an intelligence agency that is actually run. It can either be run by a seasoned diplomat uh, or, or, uh, or by a member of the armed forces. That was not uh, the case before. We've further tightened the process for illegal wiretapping, and we're doing our best uh, to uh, contain the problem of illegal um, spyware, which of course is a European problem. And I can tell you Europe has not done much uh, on this. Uh, and uh, we're not going to have a solution unless we, uh, we move at the European um, uh, level. So again, you can expect in a four-year term, especially in times of crisis, um, for mistakes to take place. Uh, if this happens, uh, I think you have to do two things. You have to assume responsibility, uh, but then you also have to do something uh, about making sure that these mistakes don't happen um, uh, again. And this is what we've done also in this case. Let me put this in a political context, because uh, you've heard your opposition talk about this. It, says, it, it feeds some of these stereotypes that are out there, right? New democracy is an authoritarian party. Mitsotakis, he's arrogant. You know, All these kind of stereotypes that, are, that have been out there um, they do tend to feed those kinds of, of, of you know, narratives. Are you worried that that narrative takes root in the, in the electorate? No, because um, I'll be very blunt. Um, for seven years, the opposition has been trying, you know, they were in the government at the time, they've been trying to portray me as somebody else, uh, as some sort of authoritarian, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, incompetency on of, uh, you know, family politics. This, and, and it's been personal attack after personal attack against me, against my family. Look, um, I think people have made up their mind. Uh, they've seen me govern the country for four years. They've seen um, Alexis Tsipras govern the country for four years. Uh, the choice in my mind is, is extremely clear. I sort of enjoy it sometimes when uh, we really take over the progressive agenda um, when it comes to issues regarding uh, you know, human rights, uh, you know, protecting the more vulnerable, the environment agendas, which should belong theoretically to the center left. I would argue that we're being by far more progressive when it comes to these topics than the previous uh, series of governments. So I understand that this causes a lot of ideological uh, confusion. But you know, at the end of the day, uh, you know, you can't argue, you know, that it's uh, uh, th that it's raining when it's sunny. And so you know, people know me. I've been you know politics for 20 years. You know, they know what they're getting uh, when they're going to vote with me. We know, you know, with my advantages, my my disadvantages, but I would really sort of encourage the Syriza uh, spin doctors uh, to have, you know, maybe choose a different strategy because for seven years it hasn't really worked. Yeah. One last one on this, I promise. As a matter of principle, should government intelligence agencies be listening in on the phone calls of uh, journalists and opponents uh, in politics? Only, um, uh, I, I w I've never argued that anyone uh, is, is off limits. But what we've done, and I think what is reasonable, is that for journalists and sort of politically sensitive um, um, uh, people, you really need to make sure that you have additional filters, uh, which also have to be judicial, uh, and, and to be sure that you have a damn good case um, uh, in order to be able to listen to someone. Uh, uh, and uh, that is exactly what we've done now. E essentially, we've made it incredibly difficult, I wouldn't say impossible, but uh, for, you know, for the uh, intelligence services to listen to someone um, um, using uh, you know, a, a legal wiretapping, you know, fully recognizing that there, there's lots of software out there by non-state actors that is able to do you know, uh, possibly much more without us even being aware of it. Huh? Well, you mentioned your opponent, Mr. Cipras. Um, he's still with us. Um, I wonder if you could just talk about your view of him as a politician. I know you disagree with him as, as, uh, on policy, but it is somewhat remarkable that this guy went, took a party that basically almost didn't exist, rode the wave of the crisis, um, became prime minister. Um, 
spent a year uh, of chaos, um, got pretty soundly defeated by you four years ago, and yet here he is within striking distance of you. What do you think of, of, of Alexis Cyprus, just as a politician and his political capability? Well, first of all, I would question the within striking distance. But um, uh, certainly, look, I've said many times that uh, I, I would never, never ask, uh, underestimate my political opponents. Uh, Alexis Tsipras is clearly someone who has you know, um, demonstrated uh, um, the political skills. At the same time, I think he, uh, he has done a horrible job as prime minister. Uh, and uh, it's my, uh, my obligation to highlight this because, uh, again, when you return back to 2015, and it's not just Mr. Tsipras who's here, huh? we also have Mr. Varoufakis. We have many protagonists of this, uh, of this saga uh, st still around. Uh, Mr. Varoufakis is still insisting that we need to replace our euros with uh, Dimitra. Uh, so um, uh, this is our new currency, according to Mr. Um, uh, uh, Varoufakis, who Mr. Tsipras would like to have in some sort of coalition government. So that's why what happened in 2015 is, again, extremely relevant. So we should not forget that in 2015, it was very easy for the then Syriza government to complete you know, uh, the fifth review. They chose to, um, to engage in a policy of extreme brinkmanship. They took the country to an unnecessary referendum. They closed the banks. They made a huge U-turn. And it cost us $100 billion. These are facts. And, the, and better, Greeks better remember them, because Mr. Tsipras hasn't changed at all. So essentially, he, he, uh, he, he hasn't made, he hasn't said he's made, you know, uh, major mistakes. So in that sense, I think uh, history is going to be um, uh, harsh um, uh, with him uh, because, uh, uh, you know, he had a chance to take the country forward and he took it backward. Because at the end of the day, you know, there's one, you know, one uh, sort of very basic yardstick when you judge the record of a prime minister. Have you taken the country forward, or have you taken it backward? Mr. Tsipras keeps telling us that it took the country out of the program he imposed upon the country. This is a, like you know, setting your house on fire and then getting credit for calling the fire brigade. I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't make much, uh, much sense to me. And frankly, it's not a very credible um, um, sort of line of argument. But let me push you on that, because I, I must say, much to my surprise in some respects, if you go to Brussels these days and you ask about Tsipras, they tend to talk about post kolatumba That's the only Greek word I know. Um, that they, there seems to be a, OK, yes, he screwed up that first year. But you know, as, as you just said, he got the country out of the program. He took the country back into the financial markets. Um, he executed the program, as you said, after he didn't execute the tax yeah. department. What would you say to some of the, the internationals well, in Brussels? Well, I'll tell them, that, you know, lucky you, because you didn't have to pay taxes in Greece. Hmm. It's because they don't pay taxes in Greece, so they can afford to look at the big picture. But for all of those who pay taxes in Greece, and uh, for the middle class that was uh, you know, destroyed uh, by a, a, a policy which I think also was class biased, uh, I'm sure they won't have uh, uh, a very sort of uh, you know, a similar view to, um, uh, um, uh, to, the, to the one that maybe, that's maybe held by some of the Brussels Illuminati. Let me turn to my last subject, which is, which is foreign policy. Um, Eastern Med, obviously during your tenure, there's been, I would say, some of the most, the, the most tense periods between Greece and Turkey that we've seen in, in, in recent times. We obviously have this odd situation where both you and Erdogan are running for re-election within a week or two of each other. Um, just curious, let's, let's make the assumption that, that both you and he get re-elected um, in May. Is Erdogan a reliable partner with which to work with, in, in your view? Let me, Peter, let me turn the clock back, you know, almost four years when I first got elected. I genuinely and honestly reached out to Turkey, trying to find a, sort of a, a new modus vivendi uh, to smoothen out our differences and to really be able to create a more constructive relationship. The truth is that if you look at the record of Turkish policy over those past three and a half years, uh, Turkey has not reciprocated. This sort of uh, blue homeland agenda has been dominant. It's a sort of... Uh, uh, old sort of uh, imperial uh, revisionism. It has demonstrated itself in Greece, in Cyprus, um, uh, with a very sort of aggressive uh, foreign policy, with the signing of a completely illegal and frankly sort of geographically ridiculous delimitation agreement between um, Turkey and Libya, uh, with uh, you know, a very heated summer uh, in, in 2020, with the weaponization of migration, um, uh, which uh, has happened uh, in, in, in March 2020, and with a very adversarial relationship not just vis-a-vis -vis Greece, but I say vis-a-vis -vis Europe and the United States. 
So I think, in, in my mind, uh, Turkey has to take a profound strategic decision after the elections. Does it want to re-engage, not with Greece or uh, you know, try to solve the Cyprus problem, does it have a real interest in engaging with the West uh, and change this approach and act as a reliable NATO member, or will it continue on a sort of, uh, sort of independently-minded foreign policy that's closer to China uh, or Russia? At the end of the day, this will determine the state of the Greek-Turkish relationship. This will determine whether we can make meaningful progress uh, on, this, on the Cyprus uh, issue. Uh, the Turkish economy is in a very, very problematic state. I think Turkey, uh, where I agree with President uh, um, uh, Christodoulidis when he said that uh, uh, he, uh, there is possibly a win-win a scenario uh, uh, in terms of re-engaging with Turkey regarding both Greek-Turkish relations and the final resolution of the Cyprus problem. But for this to happen, Turkey needs to change its approach with its current approach and with its current uh, uh, revisionism. Uh, uh, I'm afraid that one cannot be you know, particularly optimistic. No, I get it. We, you know, Erdogan has a campaign to run. You know, we saw a map, part of a campaign video, that suddenly sort of painted half of the uh, East, uh, islands uh, uh, red. Um, uh, you know, this doesn't help. You know, all this doesn't help. But uh, uh, maybe you know, after the elections, um, reality will kick in. And if reality kicks in, I think uh, uh, the Turkish uh, uh, sort of establishment and elites will realize that they have more to gain and uh, if they reach out again and engage with, uh, with the West, including Europe, than if they continue on this uh, sort of uh, independent policy, which hasn't really helped them. Well, let's, let's take that optimistic scenario. I'm an American. Let's stay optimistic. What, where is the place, I know you don't want to negotiate in public, but where would be the place for compromise, particularly on these sovereignty and, and border issues? Well, there is no discussion on sovereignty and borders, full stop. Uh, uh, and I'm, I want to be completely categorical here. We have one issue, and that is, this was always the issue. Historically, if you go back to the 70s, it was a delimitation of maritime zones. Initially, in the Aegean, um, uh, you know, after that, uh, in, the, in, in the Mediterranean. There is nothing to discuss in terms of borders and sovereignty by a Greek government with Turkey. And I want to be extremely clear on, uh, on, this, uh, uh, on, on this topic. Uh, so one has to accept the fundamental premise that we need to you know, define what is really to be discussed. But on the other hand, I also want to be clear that there are many positive agendas that we can develop. And we have developed. Deputy Minister of Foreign Affairs is, uh, is here. He was in Turkey. Many other topics we can actually cooperate with. So I would argue that there is also a scenario where we agree to disagree, where we agree that we cannot sort of resolve this outstanding problem, but we're not on each other's roads. We don't do overflights. Uh, over, uh, over Greek islands, uh, but we can work uh, on the positive agenda, civil protection. Um, the Minister of Civil Protection was actually the first um, who went to, um, uh, to Turkey to offer help. Let's build up on the people-to-people -people, um, uh, relationship between our two countries uh, and uh, make sure that we enrich the geopolitical agenda with a broader agenda that can be related to trade, uh, to culture, to the environment. We're sharing the same Aegean Sea. We're, for example, faced with the same you know, problems uh, in terms of you know, plastics pollution um, or you know, make, making sure that uh, we protect our marine environment. These are common problems. Uh, we're, we're working with uh, my good friend Eddie, with the Prime Minister of Albania, on a fantastic project uh, regarding the one river that we have in the common, the Aos in Greece, uh, Viosa in, in, in Albania, on how to create you know, uh, a, a protected river that actually flows through both our countries. I mean, these are some of the, the positive uh, agendas we can actually um, uh, build up on that will create some more positive momentum. One more thing on Turkey, and this is the role of the US. Um, we have in, in President Biden someone who, let's be honest, when you look at the two NATO allies, has kind of put his thumb on the Greek side. You've been invited to speak to Congress. You were invited to the White House. Um, but it was not too long ago where we had a president of the United States who seemed to put his thumb on the Turkish side. And we have an election coming up ourselves in, in my, the country I know best, where you could have a return of a Trump presidency. I, don't, I know you don't want to get involved in, in, in U.S. domestic politics, but let me ask you more generally. Do you view the U.S. as a reliable ally, given some of the political tensions we've had in the U.S.? Absolutely, yes. Because I think that the strategic partnership between the U.S. and Greece 
uh, and of course also the trilateral uh, sort of framework that we'll also build with, with Cyprus, I think is instrumental and vital for US interests, and this transcends um, you know, the policies of any given administration. Why am I saying this? Um, if you just look at what we're doing, the work we're doing on energy, Greece being uh, an energy hub, a regional energy hub for bringing in natural gas, you know, helping uh, Bulgaria during uh, difficult times when you know, the Russians completely cut off the gas. If it were not for gas coming in through Greece, our Bulgarian friends would have been uh, in, in great uh, uh, difficulty. Uh, making sure that uh, we use the port of Alexandrupolis as a north to south corridor that is actually bypassing the Bosporus Straits, um, uh, forging a strategic partnership on the military sort of defense side that is uh, long standing and that actually uh, looks you know, decades into the future. We will, I'm pretty sure, receive the final approval for a purchase um, uh, of, um, of 20 F 35 uh, planes to be delivered starting uh, 2028. These are long term. Uh, strategic uh, partnership arrangements, and uh, of course, I won't. I cannot comment uh, on U.S. elections, but I, I, you know, I have a very good, uh, very strong relationship with uh, President uh, Biden. But I had also met President Trump, uh, and we were able to get along uh, uh, just fine. But I knew I do need to point out that at the level of the Congress, there seems to be uh, uh, bipartisan um, uh, support vis-à-vis um, -vis, uh, the role that Greece can play. Uh, in the Eastern uh, uh, Mediterranean. Uh, I, I certainly got uh, more applause from both chambers of Congress at the US Congress than I do in the Greek Parliament. So uh, <laughs> at, um, uh, uh, so there's an indication that uh, when it comes to this part of the world, uh, at, uh, you know, at the level of, the, uh, of Congress, both the House and, and the Senate, there seems to be an understanding about Greece's strategic importance, which again, I need to point out, is not at the expense of somebody else. Um, this is a, a, a relationship that does not need to be defined in the context of what you know, the U.S. is doing uh, with, uh, with Turkey. It's a standalone relationship uh, that we greatly value. Some of your colleagues, though, around the European Council table, particularly, particularly President Macron, ha has in some ways correctly argued that if, if the U.S. is no longer going to be as reliable as we once thought it would be, um, that we need to plan for ourselves for a, a more... Um, uh, European solution to our national security. Do you disagree with, with, with President Macron? Not at all, but are the two really mutually exclusive? Uh, if you just look at, we have to be realistic, if you just look at Ukraine, um, who has provided the, you know, the bulk of the, you know, of, the, of the military support to Ukraine? Uh, I, you know, I would love for Europe to do more, and I will always encourage Europe to do more. Uh, and I think there is an argument for a European strategic uh, autonomy. Uh, that would force us to cooperate more effectively and, and maybe also be able to execute missions uh, in, in areas where maybe the U.S. does not have such a vital interest. Let me give you a, a, a real-time example. Sudan. I didn't really sense that the, that the Americans were particularly concerned with what happened in Sudan. But we couldn't really, I mean, we did a lot of bilateral agreements and we did manage to get um, our people safely out of, uh, of Sudan. But I would love to have had more European um, a, a coordination. This is a very clear example where we could have done something on our own because we would consider this to be more important than the Americans, and we're still clearly not there. So also when we are looking at our procurement decisions, uh, of course we have a long-standing relationship with the U.S., but we also want to build, when we buy, for example, French ships, and the French ships are identical to the ships that the French buy, it's you know one small step towards a common European uh, sort of procurement space, which we also need um, for our uh, defense industry, and I hope we can do uh, more in that direction. So as far as the strategic autonomy thesis of President Macron, I absolutely agree. The reason we are so dependent on the U.S. is simply because we haven't been able to deliver yet uh, on this uh, vision. One last topic, because we're running out of time, and you mentioned it already, Ukraine. Um, tragically, it has been uh, several years since I've been back here to Greece, but when I was sitting in my office in New York and I thought through the consequences of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, one of the things I must admit came to my mind was, ooh, this is going to be tough for Mitsotakis. Because this country, what I know about it, does have historical, cultural, religious ties to Russia. Um, and yet, you very early, very quickly, and very definitively sided with the Ukrainians when many of the other countries in this region did it. Talk to me about that decision and, and what, how difficult it's been for you politically, given some of the, 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 the cultural and, and religious ties that Greece does have to Russia. First of all, we have strong cultural and people-to-people -people ties, and we have 
no animosity towards uh, you know, the Russian people. But we have a real problem with Putin and with him attacking uh, a sovereign country uh, and uh, causing havoc uh, in the heartland of Europe. So for us and for me personally, and for uh, our cabinet and our party, um, uh, the decision was very, very clear. And there was really no pushback uh, also within, uh, within the party. We will support Ukraine. We will also support uh, Ukraine. We did support Ukraine militarily, uh, but also uh, politically, not just because it's the right thing to do, but because we're also sending a message to other you know, potential you know, regional powers that uh, could uh, maybe in, in their own sort of thinking um, consider doing something similar to what Russia has done. So if Russia wins, then, I mean, um, where is this thing going to uh, stop? This is, this is not about, you know, the strongest sort of defeating uh, the weakest. This is about uh, a rules-based international order. I think the European Union rose overall to the occasion, um, and we were able to, to coordinate uh, and overcome uh, internal difficulties. Overall, we didn't talk a lot about Europe, but I think there's a lot of reasons why one could be uh, positive about what Europe has done over the past years. You know, uh, the vaccines, the RRF, Ukraine, lots of good things that have happened uh, um, uh, at the European level. Uh, but for me, the decision uh, was uh, obvious, and it was not just a decision of principle. I think it was also a decision of self-interest, uh, given the position uh, of, uh, uh, of the country and the regional threats uh, it will always have to deal with. One of the narratives you hear is that time plays into Putin's hand. And one of the reasons is because, as you say, this, this alliance unanimity and, and unity that we've seen, they believe inevitably will disintegrate. Um, we've seen some noises certainly out of Hungary. We've seen some noises that the new Italian government, the new Swedish government. How concerned are you in your, in your NATO hat that the alliance will no. stick together? Uh, we will stick together. I think we know what we can do. We sort of, I think we're ramping up our uh, our support. I think there are limits to what one can um, uh, can offer. Uh, uh, but I, at the end of the day, one needs to be honest. As I told you, it's the U.S. that is driving um, this. We're all, you know, chipping in to the best of our uh, abilities. No, I'm not concerned about uh, a fragmentation in the pro-Ukrainian alliance, either at the European level, at the level of the European Council or at the, at the NATO level. This, this alliance will hold strong, and it will, it will have to prevail. Kyriakos Mitsotakis, please join me in thanking you for taking time with us. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.